So, welcome back. Uh, we have spent the last hour learning about what the research evidence of community practice says about cardiovascular aging. And now, this part of the program is hearing from you. Uh, before we get into the question, answers, and discussion here, I already have a question from Twitter. <laughs> Hashtag. <laughs> uh, how important is genetic predisposition in developing heart disease? I'll maybe direct that question to Sonia. Hey, Sonia has a grape in her mouth. So, should I just answer? So that was just a question I was asked at the break as well. So it's not a simple answer. As most of you know, there is not one gene that is associated with heart disease. We are now realizing that heart disease is a polygenetic, um, has a polygenetic basis. So you may have some genes that are associated with your cholesterol, other genes associated with your lipids, etc. So definitely genes are associated with cardiovascular risk factors. Up until now, the studies have shown that the percentage of the risk factor explained by genetics is actually quite low. So it's about, you know, maximum 10% for lipids. It's definitely not 90%. Now if I had some pure geneticists sitting here, they'd say, but we haven't sequenced everyone's genome, so it's too early to say that. But at least we've done some very good genome-wide genotyping studies, and I'd say at this point in time, 10% of coronary artery disease would be explainable by genetics. So I'm going to open up the questions to the floor. Please feel free to uh, ask your question. There are people standing around the room mics in their hand. Any questions from the crowd? There's a question <coughs> up front here. Yes. Uh, this is addressed to, uh, I've forgotten your name, the Y person. Oh. Genevieve. Genevieve. Um, has, uh, has, uh, you may have addressed that, but I, I might have missed it. Has the Y considered taking some of these programs that you cited earlier? Uh, out into the community uh, or the rural communities, uh, in other words, to the ch to churches or community centers, where the cost would be uh, less and it wouldn't be a requirement to be long to the Y, which for a rural person is usually quite far away and out of the question. Yeah, I think um, for sure we're trying to to look at how to challenge the, the rural communities. Um, for us, well. The challenge always is for to deliver um, programs externally to have, we don't necessarily have the equipment, um, and then program delivery actually becomes much more expensive taking everything out. What we are testing, I'll give you an example of something we're testing right now. We've got a program um, that was funded through US Steel, it's called Y and Wheels. And what we're finding is that there's a community in need, um, or a, a need that they, whether it's for kids programs, or seniors programs, or adult programs, they can go through Y and Wheels and request a program to be delivered. So for example, um, we've done in some, some local communities around here to test some, test some things. We've done some walking programs, we've done some Zoom programs, and brought them actually right out to the community. So the staff and equipment go out. So that's, we're trying to test that model a little bit. Um, we're trying to get a better understanding right now. We've got um, the facilities there is trying to bring things on site. We've got the expertise of the health professionals coming in and all the equipment to get that underway. But for sure it's been identified we want to do some things to support more. Um, what you could do is if you go on to uh, the YMCA of Hamilton Burlington Brantford website um, and look up the Y on Wheels program, you can submit a request there. Uh, so it's something local in your community, that would be a great way to test it. And the staff would, would train that team to come out and actually deliver that program to your community. Genevieve, to people who don't have access to the web or don't use the web, is there another way to find that information? Twitter. <laughs> <laughs> you can see me before you go, and I'm happy to share a phone number. But can they phone someone at the, one of the YMCA's to get information? Sure, they can phone any one of the local YMCA's. Um, I'm happy to give you, before we get, go tonight, a, a direct effort for the YMCA's program. Thank you. Any other questions from the... There's a question back there. Hi, my name is May. I'm asking, I think, what, I think perhaps Sonia. Uh, the, we've talked about 
genetic disposition and so on. I'm wondering about people who have been in early life some sort of, I guess, social thing that, or something that led to them being uh, poorly nourished in early life. And I'm thinking that a lot of people who went through the Second World War, I believe there have been some studies of uh, people from Holland or, or from uh, camp survivors. I'm also thinking that uh, uh, people came out of the uterus sometimes uh, malnourished. And uh, what effect does that have in their later life in cardiac and other events? Thank that, you. That's a great question. And uh, you've touched on a really important association. So babies who are born low birth weight, small, for their gestational age, have a higher risk of developing what we call the metabolic syndrome, which is uh, abdominal obesity, type 2 diabetes, sometimes hypertension, and cardiovascular disease. So the first observation came from the United King Kingdom by uh, David Barker, who demonstrated this association. And then researchers looked around the world at other populations uh, where pregnant moms experienced hardship during pregnancy, in particular famine. So in the world wars, uh, it, there was a Danish famine, and pregnant moms who were exposed to famine, uh, their offspring have a very high risk of type 2 diabetes and cardiovascular disease. So we're actually a number of groups around the world examining this, and in particular within Canada and the South Asian population, so people originate from India, uh, the babies are born low birth weight and relatively more adipose, and we're trying to understand why that is, because it's likely that in utero exposure uh, programs the baby to be high risk as an adult. So it really brings home the point that prevention may actually begin in pregnancy. And there's also some of the evidence related to that. It is not the mother's health, but the grandmother's health actually can also impact what happens to the child and, and how the child ages. Um, other questions? Yes. Yeah, I just wondered how much regular exercise compensates for having a very sedentary desk job. Compensates for... Could, could you repeat that question? A very... Like I have a desk job, so nine plus hours a day you're sitting. So, regular exercise, I do that, but does that compensate for having a job where you can sit? Yeah. Mm -hmm. I'll just weigh in, but I'm sure it's <coughs> one too. But you touched on an important point as well, because just last year was a study demonstrating that even though you're sedentary during the day and then go to the gym at the end of the day and work out on the treadmill, that doesn't compensate for the impact of sedentariness. So exercise can compensate fully for your being sedentary during the day. So, you know, there are lots of changes happening in the workplace. Some people, at least in the Netherlands now, they're using the standing desks or the treadmill desks. And certainly we recommend if you do have a desk job to get up, you know, at least once an hour, go for, you know, a five minute walk around your office and then and sit back down. I don't know if you want to add to that. But sedentary is in itself is a risk factor, even when you account for exercise done later. The only thing I might add in relation to that is, and you can correct me if I misunderstood this, but I also understand that, that there is um, the, the greatest um, relative health benefit of exercises from people who go from being sedentary to to beginning to, to exercise and having moderate exercise. So, so even even a, a, a moderate change can have a lot of impact, uh, despite uh, the, the overall issues that, that Sonia talked about. I think I use is these the little pedometers or Fitbits, those things. And you know, we typically say try and get 10,000 steps in a day. And if you wear it and you you know, get home at the end of the day after a sedentary job, you may only log 2,000 steps. So that's a real motivator to get out. I just do laps in my kitchen <laughs> until I hit 10,000. <laughs> There's another question. Uh, my question is not terribly well formed, but it has to do with early family mental health. And so in some ways it's akin to the epidemiological question that we've asked about poor nurturing. Deprivation. So, we're in the 21st century, and I notice so many adults still smoking. And I 
ask myself, don't they get it? And the message is there, it's on every cigarette package. And I'm wondering to what extent any of you knows about or has thought about linkages between early family mental health, either dysfunction or abuse, that would lead people to be uh, not wanting to take care of themselves very well. Because smoking in the 21st century is obviously a sign of almost a cause of suicide energy. It's not about smoking I'm asking, just that's the thing that triggered my thinking. It's, it's, it's a good, it's a very good question, and again, I see, I see people towards the end of life, and sometimes looking back, we try to spend several hours with these folks, because we're trying to understand all of the different issues that contribute to their current health, and current health problems, and, and when you go back to their life story, um, that may certainly have something to do with it. Obviously, there are family histories of mental health issues, and so uh, if there's a family history of mental health, this person is more likely to have depression or anxiety or, or even you know, behaviors that are addictive. And, and really what happens towards the end of life is a thing called frailty, which is this vulnerability that some people get, sometimes earlier than others. Um, one of the ways that people get there quicker. If you kind of think of the issue of an RSP, we tell you to put money in the bank to save it for when you retire so you have enough to last you through retirement. You can say the same thing about health. And so, and that's where this diabetes epidemic is it's quite frightening in children, lack of physical activity and all of that. But in a sense, if, if you were set behind in terms of your development, in terms of your opportunities, in terms of your uh, self-esteem uh, in terms of opportunities, support from your parents. If that isn't there, then you don't realize the full potential of what you could have achieved. In a sense, you don't put enough in the bank. And so when you get older, you tend to have problems earlier. So, yes, there's the genetic aspect of if someone in my family had mental health issues, I'm more likely to have them myself, which, again, can lead to poor health. But, uh, those less tangible things are probably very important as well. There's a question at the back. Right here. Uh, is there, uh, is it Q10, does it really help you cardiovascularly? Um, maybe I'll yes. answer that. So the number of people who are on statins take coenzyme Q10 uh, to kind of counteract the effect of the statin on the metabolism uh, to prevent or treat the muscle cramps that they might feel. There's not strong large-scale evidence. There is um, smaller scale mechanistic evidence, so 100 subjects, etc. So I don't say no, don't try it. If patients on statins have that, I can't guarantee benefit. And I'll, I will raise uh, your attention to a, a meta-analysis, so a study of studies that came up probably last month. Um, just showing that um, all the vitamin supplements that people think are beneficial for their health, so vitamin C, vitamin E, even a multivitamin, that we have zero evidence that it improves health, and it, we have some evidence that it causes harm in the cases of vitamin E and beta carotene. So I always find it challenging trying to promote a statin medication where there's a large body of evidence behind it, um, it's hard to kind of convince people to take it, yet they have five or six other kind of multivitamins that they pay for out of pocket, and they think that's better. So it's 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 difficult. So short answer is it's worth a try, but there's not large scale evidence to suggest benefit. George, do you want to add anything to that? In terms of the best the best vitamins come in food, really. I mean that's why. They're People who live in Crete in northern Japan do so well. They eat fresh food, they eat a varied diet, uh, and they make their own food. And so you can get more than enough vitamins in a broad array of food with a very heavy focus on fruits and vegetables and avoiding red meats. Um, and you'll enjoy it a lot better too. I don't really like pills. I, I'd rather have a nice fresh salad that tastes better. 
but you know, about being facetious. I think that's one of the things that we're not teaching our kids about cooking at home. And, and that's part of this whole lifestyle issue of having a meal at home that can prepare yourself. There's the, the enjoyment of the food, but essentially the social connections that you've got with your family, sitting down, relaxing after the day, having a meal, and, and enjoying it. <coughs> Again, you can't, you can't achieve that with, with tablets and pills. So there's many more benefits to real fresh food made at home than taking pills. It's, you've heard tonight a few times about these blue zones, uh, you know, talking about this diet, exercise, social support system. One of the other common features with all these six blue zones around the world, one of them is in Canada, in Halifax, area, that they're all stubborn people. So being stubborn is a good thing. <laughs> There's a question at the back. Stubborn. Um, probably the road to cardiovascular disease and health. And I want to know if in our late 50s, is it too late to change the trajectory of where this is going? And um, if you have, I have way too many of them. <laughs> so what, what can you do to try to get rid of some of these uh, very scary kinds of things? I know this whole thing is an easy one, I think, but not so easy for me to lose weight. So, uh, what kinds of advice do you give for people who are in their late 50s who want to be on the other side of the line? Start with Vincent. Vincent, do you want to comment on that? Um, I think I would just uh, say to um, that, that, that start where, where you're comfortable, whether it's uh, with diet, whether it's with exercise, um, small changes can have an impact and they, they will accumulate over time and I don't think it's, it's ever too late for someone to make change. Um, so, um, you know, probably, probably the best advice is to, to, to smart, start small and, and move from there and, and, and develop habits, right? If, if, if you develop healthy habits uh, that you can continue over time, then, then over time they will have a cumulative net benefit for you. Genevieve, do you want to add something? No, I, I just... Again, I'll share with you a little story, and I think it's never too late. Um, if we have that mindset of it being never too late, things can just get worse, and if it means that we can maintain. Um, we had a woman that came into our program uh, and had a lot of significant health. Actually, she came to us when she started in a scooter. Um, had diabetes, a um, whole significant bunch of things going on. Over the course of a year and a half, um, lost 100 pounds. Um, is now a certified fitness leader, leading instructors, not in her scooter anymore. Um, came off all of her diabetes medication. And that's a lofty goal. I think when she came in, her goal was, I'm gonna lose 110 pounds. It was, I'm gonna make a healthy choice every day. So today it's about getting up and walking for 10 minutes. And maybe tomorrow it'll be 15 to 20 minutes. Um, she looked at it as every meal and said, I'm gonna eat a little bit healthier today. Um, so those small changes were extremely cumulative and it became something she could maintain um, was also able to when we celebrated her success and where she'd gone um, one of her personal goals was she'd never been able to ride a bike with her kids and in terms of there's the, you know the medical conditions and all those things go with it but there's so many social things that go in um, so when she achieved that weight loss we actually celebrated that with getting the family bikes and she was able to go on her first bike ride with her two kids um, there's not a price she can pay on that. So although the physical health, um, if she'd said it was never too late, she would have not hit the physical benefits she had, but also just achieved uh, a dream that was really right there. She just had to make some good choices every day. You earlier heard a story from George talking about this uh, turbine tornado. He actually, his wife passed away at age 83, and he went into depression for four years. After that, he decided he was going to do something about it, and he had never ran any race marathon or anything like that prior to that. And here he was at age 100, running a full marathon in eight hours. So I don't think it is ever late to start. So start today. <laughs> I just also add that if you're late 50s and you actually have measurable risk factors, they are in cardiovascular disease for the most part treatable. So, you know, we can lower cholesterol, we can treat blood pressure, we can treat diabetes. So that's, a, that's great because in the area of cancer, the you know, understanding of the causes and the treatments aren't as well developed.
but the combination of treating risk factors with proven medications and changing your lifestyle, becoming more active, eating better, can do uh, a lot in terms of preventing eventual cardiovascular disease. More questions back here? We occasionally attend uh, to a naturopath, and I mean, this young lady is trained in her field, very sincere, very well read as far as we can tell anyway. Are there, so my question is this, are there any natural remedies out there that could be beneficial that you might be aware of? I know pill form or capsule form and that, but are there any out there that would be helpful? Who wants to start on that one? Well, I will start. Just thinking cardiovascular disease, not all illnesses, depression. So if we just think cardiovascular, there aren't any that I can think of that have been well proven. So we practice what we call evidence-based medicine. So we look to see has a large enough study being done with an experimental design, so flip of the coin, half get the drug, half don't. If the study's been really well done and we think it's a valid study, then we typically believe it. We often don't believe it after one trial. We need a few trials to really believe it. So, you know, things like omega-3 and 6 fatty acids that lots of people were taking as fish oil. You know, recently, large trials have demonstrated they don't reduce cardiovascular disease. So, you know, sometimes we say absence of proof is not proof of absence. However, if we, on the other hand, have proof that a lot of conventional medications work, what sometimes baffles me is why patients are so reluctant to go on the prescription medications and stay on them long term, yet they'll pay out of pocket to use um, treatments that are not as well proven. That's my perspective. Aren't you, aren't you forgetting aspirin, which is a thousand years old? Yeah, I, I consider that uh, evidence-based medicine because it... Aspirin was, it was a thousand years ago, a homeopathic medicine, it's the bar of the world. But then it was tested in good trials and we believe it. So there may be some of these things that actually have benefit, but we wait for the large randomized trials before we... I think the point here is that if, the, as the evidence becomes available, if something works or doesn't work, there is no hesitation from the medical community to prescribe if there's a good evidence. But if there's not a good evidence, then it's a questionable practice of medicine. And I think that's what Sonia was trying to get at. George, do you have anything to add? Or? Yeah, I think, I think the key is evidence. And, and uh, it's interesting because heart disease, you know, we, we use drugs called ACE inhibitors, and they're wildly effective medications. And original ACE inhibitor was diluted viper venom. Um, Coumadin, rat poison, is actually from spoiled hay. Um, but again, like Sonia said, the difference is somebody actually sat down and studied it and made sure that it was effective and then replicated the trial. Um, I think one of the key things that needs to happen, I'm sure there are things that are prescribed by naturopaths that work, but there needs to be, and it's somehow there needs to be more rigor in the way that these things are studied. Uh, because, again, you are paying out of pocket for it. Um, and, and if you pay for something that doesn't work, you know, that's, that's, that's a harm. If you're going to pay, I remember seeing one patient who was taking something called belladonna alkaloids for her bowels. And some of you might know that belladonna alkaloids properties that are so-called anticholinergic. And the acetylcholine is the key brain chemical that allows your brain to function. And she was mad as a hat, literally. And she was going to a nursing home. And we stopped all these things, and we diverted the nursing home admission. Again, not all naturopathic medicines are like that, but you want to know the pros and cons of the drug. And, and the only way to do that is to evaluate them rigorously. So again, it's no... I, you know, I, I'm sure the naturopaths are great people and they do provide really good advice. The issue is if I'm going to prescribe something or make you pay for it, at least there should be some data to support it. Is there a question back and then one in front here? Oh, there's one back there as well. Um, yeah, my question is, um, 
question is regarding uh, diet and specifically fats in diet. I'd like to know what the latest is on the types of fats and the quantity of fats you should have. I know um, uh, for years it was thou shalt not have any cholesterol and eggs have a lot of cholesterol, so we weren't allowed to eat eggs for a long time. Is that still the case? And what kind of fats basically should we have in our diets? Well, it, I presented rounds two weeks ago called Demystifying Medicine, and it was all about eggs as the example that it's really confusing. If you think back to all the covers of Time magazine, one day eggs are bad, the next week they're good. So it is confusing. I think, uh, you know, 20 years ago, the American Heart Association was really kind of anti-fat and promoted low-fat diets. And so what happened is people reduced all fats and then uh, replaced those calories with uh, high sugary or high glycemic carbohydrates. And so when people looked at what happened to the lipid profile of Americans or North Americans, actually it did not improve. So now we realize that there are um, some good fats, and typically we don't say across the board reduce all fats, but we do uh, typically say reduce uh, animal fats or saturated fats, and certainly trans fatty acids. But we promote uh, unsaturated fats or monounsaturated fats, polyunsaturated fats. So will you promote eggs now? Oh, so eggs. Um, <laughs> eggs, uh, as a, a postdoctoral fellow and I reviewed the evidence about four years ago, and we found there was low quality evidence supporting an association between eggs and cardiovascular disease. However, there is a, a prominent cardiologist at University of Western Ontario who uh, is very much against egg yolk, and I think that contributes to some of the confusion. But what we observe when we plot out all the studies are, are the egg producer funded studies side with, you know, eggs aren't bad for you. And the other extreme people say they are, we don't have enough data to know, but there is not strong evidence that they are bad for you. What about bacon? Bad. <laughs> Um, in addition to the question I had back there, what percentage of our diet should then be fat? Yeah, I mean, it depends, again, on, on who you ask, but I think, and you can tell me what heart stroke promotes, but I would say definitely less than 30% of your calories consumed by fat. Do you say anything? I say less than 10% saturated fat, but less than 30% of all. Yeah, I don't think we describe it in, in, in those terms. Uh, we, we recommend that people follow the Canada Food Guide as, as the guide to a uh, healthy diet. So it's, it's more about having, having a balance um, and with an emphasis on, on uh, fruit and vegetables. So let's go with 30, less than 30%, right? <laughs> there was a question back there, and then one question up here and another one here. Recently, there have been some studies emerging. I was wondering if you're aware of studies connecting statins, so statins for cardiovascular, but on the other side, lowering cholesterol is associated with increased risk of Parkinson's and Alzheimer's, and that seems to be the major trend, so I was wondering if you have any comment on that. George, you want to have the, at least the Alzheimer's? Yeah, one? I think the cholesterol story needs to be interpreted in terms of the overall fitness of the individual and also the kind of study that was conducted. So uh, there are studies that are out there that suggest that having low cholesterol is associated with bad outcomes. But these studies are often done in people who have already pre-existing disease or maybe they are in the process of developing Alzheimer's disease or they're malnourished or there's some sort of malignancy hiding or they're already sick. In which case, low cholesterol is just a marker that you are sick. Um, and so that's going to be very important. And a lot of these studies are done where they basically do what's called a cross-sectional study. So if we were to do a cross-sectional study today, I would go and measure all your cholesterols and look at your health. And I might find that those with low cholesterol have poor health. The kind of study that the CLSA is, they're starting with people at a certain point and they're going to measure all sorts of things and measure them through time. And so that's a stronger study design because you know what the risks or what the exposures or what their characteristics were, and then you measure something more firm as an outcome later on. 
So the thing about Alzheimer's disease and cholesterol, um, there's a lot of science that's based on non or quasi experimental designs. Some will suggest that actually going on statins prevents Alzheimer's disease. Some of them say that having high cholesterol leads to Alzheimer's disease. Uh, the bottom line is we're not sure. If you do have Alzheimer's disease, there have been a number of randomized controlled trials. Again, the, the flip of the coin one, we're prescribing a statin for cholesterol lowering does nothing to alter the course of the Alzheimer's disease. But um, again, one of the problems with the studies is that death usually happens quicker than the development of dementia. So when someone does a, a large clinical trial, they start to measure outcomes like death and heart attack. The study gets stopped because obviously you don't want to wait till everyone's died. And so the dementia never fully develops. So we're not really sure whether starting a cholesterol pill in a younger age group will actually prevent dementia. What we do know is that if you have it, cholesterol lowering agents don't affect it either way. Um, dementia is a very key one. And I think what we do know is that blood pressure control may certainly prevent dementia. But more importantly, again, getting back to the exercise, there's a lot of good evidence now that when you exercise, you're actually getting more blood flow into your brain, your cognition actually improves. So it's not just, if you're needing another reason to go exercise, there's a good chance that exercise will delay or prevent dementia. Great, thanks, George. We should move on. There's a question from you. Um, is there any information um, or evidence around meditation and its effect on yeah, uh, there is, and it, it seems to do positive things from the perspective of lower blood pressure, lower the kind of epinephrine stimulation of your your heart, so you have a lower heart rate. And there's been some nice studies done by a cardiologist named Dean Ornish. You may have seen some of his work. So he had this kind of healthy lifestyle intervention that combined diet with uh, also exercise and then yoga meditation. And in the, his initial study, his healthy lifestyle intervention was able to help uh, avert a bypass graft surgery in individuals with significant coronary disease. So that's one example. And I think from the studies I've read, there's increasing evidence that uh, meditation is certainly effective in lowering one's stress response to stressful situations. And we do know stress is associated with cardiovascular events. So emotional stress in the 24 hours before a heart attack is clearly correlated with the heart attack. There was a question here, and then there was another question here. Um, eight and a half years ago, almost nine years ago now, I became the primary caregiver for both of my folks who were in their, oh, they were approaching, when well, they were over 85, and both of them had health care issues at that time. My mom developed cancer, my dad had a serious heart attack. So anyway, um, my mom is now 96, she'll be 97 pretty soon, and the thing that I came to understand with both my mom and dad is that as they naturally became older, that they became, that something happened and they started to naturally lose interest in life. And I actually thought that that was a very healthy development in them. We're really not designed to last forever. And I think sometimes in your mid-40s and 50s, and anyone younger, they're not going to be able to appreciate that. But what I have found is that, and maybe you'd like to comment on this, and maybe you're not ready to, but at what age do you think it's okay to let someone die? My mother is now, um, she broke her hip in May, and she had a, a hip replacement. And, um, you know, I have to hear every day how she doesn't want to be here anymore. And that's despite being on antidepressants. So I think that there's something sort of screwy here somewhere. Both my parents have had really quite a wonderful life. They were born into the First World War, lived through the Depression, were actively involved in the Second World War, had six kids. And, you know, they really had enough of life. And they've heard it all and been there and done that. And I think there should be some consideration given to telling very elderly people that if they feel ready to die, that that's probably okay. And can't we help them do that too? So yes, I'm very interested in, in maintaining health and fitness for myself because I think it makes me more useful to people and it certainly brings pleasure, pleasure to me. 
but I think that we should look at the other way. Sure, there's the, the odd person who's 100 and out there, you know, running a marathon, but uh, for most of the people that I am involved with in seniors' residences and assisted living, when they are into their early 90s, they are ready. And so why can't we talk about that too? short, maybe we will organize another scientific cafe yeah. like that on that topic sometime in the near future because it's a big topic. And, and just to add to your right, we give examples of successful agers, but there are people who struggle with it. And I think that's the 20 to 25 percent of the population we were talking about that we have to figure out what type of care uh, to provide them in the best fashion. George? It's a tough call because I remember having, I was resident here, uh, we had a patient who was 92 years old and uh, she'd fallen and broken her shoulder, her wrist, her hip, her ankle, and she said, matter of fact, I'm ready to die. And, and we got into a lot of trouble by prescribing an antidepressant. But after a couple of weeks, she was changing her attitude. Now, you know, it's, it's hard to comment on, on individual cases, but there are issues that antidepressants don't work, and that long-term care environments are dreary and uninteresting, and it's it's easy to sort of fall into this notion that perhaps they're correct, but until we have a system that can be really good at managing symptoms and depression and, and pain and, and change the environment, um, it's a tough one to say, yeah, let's go ahead and do that. They tried that in Belgium, they had one guy with dementia who said, if I get Alzheimer's, put me down. He got Alzheimer's and he's happy. And things change, and it's a very, very, it's a very difficult one to answer. But it, it, it's still an important topic yeah. as a society, as a yeah. community, we have to have a discussion. And we have one last question because it's already 8.25, so we'll take the last question here. It looks like we can go for another hour, but we can start. I'll keep it short. Uh, if you've already been diagnosed with the buildup of plaque in your uh, in your artery, can it be reduced or merely maintained so that it won't get any worse? So both. Um, and, uh, I think it can be reduced, huh? So surgery. Oh, so oh, oh. right. So what you, what we typically do is we see if you've had any symptoms of stroke, um, and we also look at the percent of blockage that you have and again using some of these large randomized trials that directs us to recommending either going to have your artery cleaned out in surgery um, versus being treated with medications. So it can't be reduced medically? So the use of the cholesterol lowering drugs and other things like aspirin etc don't reduce the degree of stenosis sometimes they stabilize the plaque but it doesn't reduce. Well, thank you very much uh, for sparking such a wonderful discussion. Um, our evening has now come to a close. I'd like to thank our experts here, Sonia Nan, Vincent Boma, George Heckman, and Genevieve Valadish for being here. And we have a small token for uh, token of our appreciation for each one of them. Do I don't get one? <laughs> <laughs> Sonia for you. <laughs> And actually, we should be giving this type of bag to everyone who came here, right? <laughs> um, <laughs> that's a good idea, right? Um, I would also like to thank all the staff and the volunteers who helped out with the event. They're all sitting, walking around. These people have done a lot of work. Before you leave, please take a moment and complete the short survey, which was on your chair, because your feedback is very much appreciated because it allows us to organize events like this in the future in a better way. And you can drop off the information, uh, uh, you can drop off the survey of the information table as we exit. And I would also like to mention two events that will be hosted uh, at, by the McMaster University in the Barge Optimal, Optimal Aging Initiative this spring. On April 2nd at 7 p.m., award-winning journalist Steve Pakin will host a public talk on aging in the workplace. We'll extend 
aging in the workplace called will extended and second careers become the norm. And the following night, on April 3rd, there will be a second presentation called Do Celebrities Do More Good Than Harm With Their Medical Advice? And the, the evening begins at 7 p.m. It will be hosted by Julia Williams, who is a, a writer from McLean, McLean's Magazine. Both events will take place here at McMaster Innovation Park. If you would like more information about these upcoming events, please pick up a flyer, which is at the information table at the back. And also sign up if you're interested in our Committee Longitudinal Study on Aging newsletter. That's, that information is available there. Again, thank you very much for coming. And thank you again to our uh, speakers and everyone. Good night.